1997 book, Russian Talk, Culture and Conversation During Perestroika. She has written about economic survival after the collapse of the Soviet system and state corruption and the Russian mafia. She is currently researching the Kremlin's nuclear saber rattling after the takeover of Crimea and writing a book about thugocracy with several Colgate students. I can't think of better timing for this talk, and I invite you to uh, listen to Nancy as she fills us in. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? I'm short. <laughs> there we go. Um, if you can't, if, if I stray from the microphone, please raise your hand and go like this. Um, so thank you all so much for coming tonight. I, it's really, it's actually really exciting to see local communities come out for this talk. Um, this is the eighth time or ninth that I've given some version of a talk on what's going on with Russia and the United States today. Um, uh, the first one, though, was raised in the green room, the large room in uh, the Colgate Inn about a year and two months ago, right after Trump took office. Um, the Madison uh, County Democrats invited me, and uh, I wouldn't be doing this tonight if it hadn't started with that invitation to give a 10-minute talk and to kind of uh, help the local community to theorize what's going on from the standpoint of somebody who's actually worked uh, in Russia, and who has actually, uh, now really glad I had this experience, actually had some, uh, spent some time with some Russian mafiosi in uh, the summer of 1996. So I'm going to tell you about that summer in a few minutes, um, and um, kind of fill you in on, on what spending time with the Russian mafia has given me in terms of a theory of what's going on um, today. So I want to start by asking you all a question. How many of you are sort of following or intensely following the Cambridge Analytica story that's been breaking for the last week or so? OK. Uh, and how many of you have heads that are spinning? <laughs> OK. So the fact that your heads are spinning is not incidental. The fact that your heads are spinning, the fact that you have a sense of absurdity, of chaos, of confusion, of, of just that maddening sort of throbbing head where you can't possibly get a hang on what's going on, is part of this phenomenon that in the, in the past year, since starting to give these talks, I've come to call philgocracy. And so since that's a, a new word, uh, I, I made a little handout with a kind of um, definition um, of what philgocracy means. It's uh, it, the first time you say it, it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. But once you say it a few hundred times, you'll find that it becomes part of your daily vocabulary. As it is for me, my poor husband John is over there and about 10 times in the evening when we're watching various news reports, um, we stand up and go, democracy, democracy. Um, one of my students, Jake Scott is sitting right here. Jake has been a part of the MCCTA steering committee from its very beginnings. Uh, he's a sophomore at Colgate University studying economics, uh, but also very politically active. Uh, Jake is uh, one of the five wonderful students working on the Thugocracy book with me, and Jake has drafted a fabulous chapter, and he knows probably more details a book about Thugocracy than I do at this point. Um, and has helped to compile databases. We have probably 10,000 data points by now um, that five students have helped to compile. Um, and I'm going to ask Jake a question at a certain point and put him on the spot. Um, so I, I suspect that my students, as when we meet the students, we, we say, thugocracy, thugocracy, they're all the thugs. And we even know the thug handshake. So Jake is going to demonstrate the thug handshake. Um, the thug handshake. <laughs> the chaos that you feel, the confusion, the head spinning, 
the, the, the handshake, the performativity of the Thogakrag thug handshake, handshake, these are not incidental. These are all part and parcel of the deep fabric of Thogocracy. So what do I mean when I talk about Thogocracy? We all experience the constant, and I think it's shifting in the last couple of weeks, and Cambridge Analytical may push it over the edge. Um, for, but for the past year, there has been a narrative out there about uh, America hacked by Russia, America as Putin's target, the target of the Kremlin, America as the quasi-innocent, kind of maybe the dupe, the victim, and the Trump campaign staff as the as the maybe the dupes in this in this situation that the that the Kremlin played them using cr great long-standing Soviet and post-Soviet Kremlin methodologies, and I have come to the point. It didn't it took. It's taken me this whole year basically, but I've come to the point where I want to offer you a different theory of the case, a really different theory of what has been happening to us all and to the world. Uh, since uh, November 2016. And the theory of the case, and it's kind of symbolized by the photograph I put up here of, of Trump and Putin. The theory of the case is that thugocracy, a mode of governance, a mode of domination characterized by corruption, criminality, the privatization of public resources, authoritarianism, nationalism, masculinism, militarism, threat, assassination, and other forms of violence. That thugocracy is a, is a mode of power and a mode of social and political domination and economic domination um, that is widespread throughout the world and it has been for centuries, if not millennia. Um, the thugocrats are the ones who use various kinds of force or threat of force to corrupt a society. And this is a, there, you know, Plato wrote about the corruption of society. This is not a new phenomenon. Democracies and other, some other forms of governance rose up, and you can see this in the, in the founding materials of our own US democracy. Democracies rose up in tension with corrupt governance, in tension with the potential that always exists in any polity, in any society, for the, the more powerful to use their power uh, in corrupt ways. And so democracy is quite explicitly organized to try to reduce the levels and the scales and the forms and practices and opportunities for the thugocrats. Um, but, but Thugocracy, the thugocrats, the thugs, the mafias, the government mafias are always there. There is no society that doesn't have them. They are kept at bay to greater or lesser extent. Um, and the th my theory of the case is that kind of in contrast to the notion that the Kremlin is this powerful um, Putin-dominated thugocratic society that made a, a, a sort of dupe out of American um, democracy and the American electoral system. The theory that I'm offering is that in fact, and this is very painful for certain people, <coughs> for many people to hear, it's, very, it's been very painful actually to absorb this reality. It's still not really sitting fully in my soul. Um, but the, the, the theory is that in fact what has happened and what we're seeing is the result of uh, probably four decades, maybe longer, um, of, a, of certain clans, networks of, um, of corrupt business people and corrupt, um, people, corrupt people in government who have um, managed over time, and, and Trump in the United States right now is sort of the figurehead of this kind of clan, have managed over the decades to bring themselves to the point of, of being elected. And, and Putin, of course, was just re-elected for his umpteenth term. Uh, it'll be, he's been in power for 18 years, so he gets another six on top of that. That'll bring him to a little more than a, a quarter century. The, the thugocrats in Russia and the thugocrats in the United States in many ways have the same chronological history. Um, Trump's family, Trump's father was notoriously um, famous for working with the New York area mafia. Trump, as Jake Scott is now uh, sadly an expert in, uh, he's nodding his head, Jake has been cataloging the numerous 
connections with the mob that Trump has had and Trump and the Trump organization has had um, since the 1970s. And those developed with great acceleration in the 1980s, and then they, and then even more in the 90s, even more in the thousands, and even more in the last decade. Um, and what's really awful and terrifying is to see that he, that Jake, using publicly available resources, um, but using them very well as uh, Colgate students have learned how to do, um, has compiled a database of extraordinary depth showing. Trump's connections with um, with mafiosi, first with Amer mafiosi in America, Cosa Nostra, Genovese, and um, Gambino, and other crime families in New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania, um, but then with from the from the early 1980s when there were lots early 1980s, right? Uh, um, and it's kind of hard to pinpoint when the first one was, probably 1984. Um, with an increasing number of Russian emigre mafiosi. Um, and we have, uh, I'll just show you, these are just the Russian names. Um, and this, is, uh, this is a short list. There are about, I don't know, 80 names on this list. These are the names of Russian mafiosi figures that Trump has some direct or, or close but indirect contact with. And where you see red are very close contacts with people with whom he's worked uh, very, very closely in many of his different businesses. And many, many of the people, these are the Russians. Um, I only brought the Russian printout because the American list is even longer. Um, these are, many of these figures are people who have direct contacts with Vladimir Putin or with people in Vladimir Putin's most intimate circle, and these are um, these are mafi these are mafiosi in a very literal sense, gangsters um, or the family members of gangsters, and I mean real gangsters, people who get people assassinated or who carry out assassinations themselves, or they're quasi gangsters, they're business people, oligarchs who are so mafiaized, so gangsterized, so criminal in how they run their enterprises that we count them in, under the, the terminology of thugs. Um, so what, has, what we see happening is that Trump, in his chronological history of, um, of partnering with, with mafiosi on the US side, and then partnering with Russian mafiosi who came over from the 1980s in waves, um, and are now fully entrenched in the United States and as everywhere in the world. Um, and Eurasian mafiosi who are still working in Eurasia who are circulating in Russia and all of the post-Soviet countries and the post-Soviet post bloc countries in Eastern Europe, um, that these, these gigantic networks of thugs, these thugocratic mafias, are, have in the last couple of years really probably most intensely starting in 2013 when Trump went to Russia with the Miss Universe pageant and hung out with, with thugs, real live thugs, real killing gangsters, not just sort of quasi-gangsters, but real gangsters. Um, that especially since 2013 or so, these thugocratic transnational net, multinational networks have gotten as thick as thieves, as they say. They have become very, very, very deeply entwined. And they are now very, very deeply entwined with our government. They're embedded in, our, in the US government. They are doing projects in or alongside the US government. They are doing projects that benefit themselves and using, um, using the resources of the US government. So that is, uh, that's not exactly the way that, that, we're, that we have generally been thinking about it, as these two sort of thugocratic systems coming into full-scale transnational entwinement. Um, so what is, what is thugocracy? The, the reason I know something about thugocracy is that in 1996, and, and Russian thugocracy in particular, is that in 1996 I was in Russia doing uh, field research during the summer. And I was in a, a city named uh, outside of Moscow, the city of Yaroslavl, which is a depressed, sort of rust belt uh, post-Soviet city um, with lots of unemployment and lots of crime. And I was interviewing business people, and 
uh, one of them, sort of as a joke, said, you want me to put you in touch with one of my friends? He's also in business. I said, sure, great, because anthropologists do their work by networking, just like folks. <laughs> um, so, you know, somebody offers to introduce you to somebody else, you take them up on it. So he said, great, I'll put him, put him in touch with you. The next day, uh, 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 somebody called my phone and uh, said, hi, this is Misha, I'm the, fr uh, the friend of your friend, and I would like to take you out to lunch. And if you want to interview me, you can. And I said, terrific. So this guy came to my apartment. He knew exactly where, to, I didn't tell him the address, but he knew where I lived. Um, and he picked me up in a battered black Mercedes, charming, 30-something, blonde, Russian, charming Russian business guy in a, in a black suit took me to a cafe, and we sat down in the cafe. We walked right back through the, through the back curtain of the cafe, and we sat in a little corner booth with the curtain all around. The waitress bought us food without him even ordering the food, and vodka, and that was weird. Um, so then I, I pulled out my little anthropologist's notebook, and I, I asked him, OK, Misha, this is in Russian, uh, what kind of business are you in? Kakoi uh, vas business. Uh, and he said, uh, he leaned across the table and he smiled charmingly and he said, Ya bandit, I am a bandit. And I knew the slang, uh, I knew that when that, that the mafiosi called themselves bandits. So when he said, Ya bandit, I knew that he was telling me he was a, a, a gangster. And bandit means a sort of mid to higher level gangster, not just the street thug. Uh, so I said, oh. Okay, and um, well, that's not what I was expecting here, but uh, okay, well, here's, look, can I tape you? He didn't let me tape him. I said, well, can I take notes? He said, sure, fine. I said, well, so let me ask you a bunch of questions, and I started asking him questions. Fortunately, because everybody in the 90s in Russia was talking about gangsters all the time, and I had been doing research in Russia con continually from 1985, I knew exactly what kinds of questions to ask, because I had a good sense of what, what um, banditism, banditism was all about in Russia. So I, you know, do you ever kill people? What's it like being a bandit? What kind of business are you in? Um, and he had smooth talking answers for every question that I asked. No, we don't kill people. My, our bandits, Banjugi, our bandits are nice young guys. They don't smoke, they don't drink, they're family guys. And we just help the, the local businessmen iron out their conflicts. They're always having contract dis disputes. And we're kind of like lawyers in your country. We help them iron out their disputes without getting in fights. Sure. Um, I, so I took this interview, and then he said, would you like to go with me while I do my errands? And of course, as an anthropologist, I said, sure, of course I would. Um, so for the rest of the day, and then for another day, uh, later in that week, I, uh, I actually drove around with him while he did his, made his rounds in Yaroslavl. And we went to several banks. Uh, he had arguments with one banker. Uh, he had a really nice time with another. We went to a number of different stores, and Misha would would go into the store, and I would trail along, uh, just kind of like, "Hi, I'm Nancy." Um, for t I do speak Russian, and people don't really think I'm not Russian because there aren't very many Americans in Yaroslavl anyway at that time. Anyway, that weren't so. Um, so we went to businesses, we went to the local Ben and Jerry's, we went to some little shops, we went to uh, uh, several um, um, sort of new clothing stores, um, and we went to a gigantic brand new German funded university. This was a, a huge, beautiful, totally renovated three-story building with marble floors and, and beautiful carved wooden banisters, and we went upstairs to the third floor, and we walked right into the hallway of the, um, the director's office. It was about the size of the, this whole area of the, of the Colgate Inn, and it was about as grand. The, the secretary of the university, the vice chancellor, uh, said, hi, come on in. Uh, and we just walked right in, like, you know, without any, uh, any pause. We just walked right through. And the, uh, the university uh, president, I think he was president, uh, asked us if we'd like a drink, and then they brought a whole tray of food, and Misha talked to him for a long time in bandit slang, which I understood only some of, um, but they obviously had a relationship. Um, and, uh, and, and I spent that day, and then another day we, we, did, we traded in his, 
it is via his Mercedes for a, a brand new Jeep. Um, he took a pile of money about the size of these books, a pile of dollars, $100 bills about, about that big, and he ran it through a, a money counting machine to, to check for counterfeit money. Um, we drove around town meeting this kind of person and that, went to a bunch of different uh, kiosks, um, and everywhere Misha was greeted with a warm reception. Everybody in town knew him, they all liked him, except for this one argument, they were all doing they were all doing the thuggercratic <laughs> moves. Um, and what I learned from that, I, and I, I also, uh, he also took me out to meet his, his young musician friends who I later understood were uh, living in the safe house uh, where the mafia gangs would meet up. And I happened to be there when three gangs showed up in three cars. That's a whole other story. Um, what I learned from this, and I've written about it, uh, was has held me in good stead until the Trump presidency, was that mafiosi are not sort of these, um, well, they are kind of like the gangsters in the movies. They are, um, they are stitchers together. They, they float around the interstices. They float around the spaces between different social groups. So on the late afternoon of the first day I drove around with him, we pulled into a parking lot, and Misha stopped his car, and there was a police car nearby. And uh, I thought, oh great, I'm, you know, American anthropologist in the car with the thug, um, the bandit. Uh, but no, in fact, the policeman came over to Misha, and they had a conversation. And then they went outside, and they went over to the policeman's car, and they had another conversation. And when Misha came back to the car, he said, well, uh, you know, the policemen in Yaroslav don't know where to buy bullets, so we help them buy bullets for their guns. Was anything he said to me really true? It was, I don't think so. I think it was all half true. But what was true, and I saw it with my own eyes, and I am so thankful for this experience and to have survived it, um, is that... Uh, is that the bandits travel throughout society and they stitch together different kinds of interests. They stitch together business and higher education and, and, um, and, and political leaders and policemen. And, they, and they're, like these, they're like lawyers and accountants. They do all these different kinds of services for different sectors of society. They, of course, profit from that. They, of course, take from that. They take their percentages. They run uh, the operation of Krisha, which is basically the protection racket. If you start a small business, and that's what we were doing, basically, when we visited the little stores. We were going into the stores where Nisha's gang offered protection. We will protect you from the other gangs, they would say, if you pay us 10% of your, of your gross. It's not good net. If you pay us 10% of your gross, we'll protect you from the other gangs. Of course, the gangs are in cahoots with each other, so they're threatening the, the businesses, but they're all collaborating on that. They're all threatening society as a whole so that they can then profit from protecting people from the threats which they themselves are creating. That's thugocracy. So, I, so I got to saw, see this firsthand, but then I also lived in Russia in the early, from the early 90s through the, uh, through the late 90s, I lived there many times, and what was also happening at that time is that a young, uh, youngish KG, former KGB agent, uh, have, having come back from Hamburg, from, uh, no, from, from Dresden, uh, to, the, to Russia, Vladimir Putin, who came back from Germany to Russia when the, the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union ultimately fell apart, Vladimir Putin went to work for um, Subchak, the mayor of St. Petersburg, from the er very, very beginning of the 90s. And remember, the Soviet Union ended in 91. So Putin is working with Subchak, and he's using KGB skills, KGB banks, because the KGB always had banks all over the world. Why would the KGB need banks? to get money to pay all of the informants in all of the countries where they operated. The KGB had banks all over the world, including in the United States, hidden secret banks. Um, so Putin comes back to St. Petersburg. He works with Subchak, the mayor, and he is in charge of um, city property, which basically means 
figuring out how to turn state property from the Soviet state into private property. And that's what Putin, that was Putin's first task in the 1990s. He had many other tasks. He, he, he uh, was the deputy mayor and he became um, the person in charge of uh, facilitating various kinds of trade between local businesses and international organizations and businesses. And those, that trade was going in multiple directions. And basically what this was doing was, was privatizing the um, state resources and selling them off. Everything from bread and, and grain to metals and cars and airplanes, whatever kind of commodity the Soviet state had in its inventories and the nascent Russian state had in its inventories, Putin figured out how to, how to commercialize those and privatize those and trade those and profit from those and make sure that this growing plutocratic gang around him in St. Petersburg benefited from. And that gang that grew around Putin, and he was, Putin was really good at this. He was really good at this. So he worked with, famously worked with the local mafias, so many of them. He worked with the larger Russian mafias and the Eurasian mafias and the Azerbaijani mafias and the Kazakhstani mafias, all of which were circulating throughout that entire space. Um, and he le learned really well how to work how to work out deals between the government, the ex-KGB, and the new FSB, the, the, the security services, um, the, uh, the, um, the business people, and all kinds of other social sectors. Um, and that was his forte, was figuring out how to get these people and these people and these people to do a deal which ultimately would benefit him and a very small circle of cronies. And in that process, they, they developed the systems for privatizing all of the resources of the state that could possibly be privatized. And that's resources from oil to airplane factories and car factories to, to, to farms, agriculture, um, beautiful old palaces in St. Petersburg. P St. Petersburg is full of palaces. It's got hundreds or thousands of small things that are called palaces. And they figured out how to privatize all of these state, formerly state-owned 18th and 19th century beautiful buildings. Um, and, and trade them around and make sure that their cronies controlled all of these things. Um, through, through that thugocracy, Putin rose, and it's a complicated story. If you're interested, this is a, a, a really wonderful book. It's on, on the list by, uh, that I handed out by Karen DeWisha, Putin's Kleptocracy. And this tells the, the whole story in phenomenal detail of how Putin did that and what he did in the early 90s and beyond to create a, uh, a whole thugocracy. So, um, what is thugocracy? Thugocracy is a system, and, I, and I've, I've, I'll leave you with you know, the, this list for you to study. It's a system of close and profitable ties between corrupt government, shadow businesses, big businesses, not just shadowy businesses, but some of these are really, are really big and transnational, um, and organized crime, often abetted by corrupt judiciary, police, security, and intelligence agencies. That is the nature of the Russian state. The Russian state, and I will say this you know, really, really clearly and explicitly, and I don't think many people will disagree, the Russian state is thuggercratic from top to bottom. Russians who are not in the thrall of Putin, and many are in the thrall of Putin, um, are, uh, are completely aware of this thuggocracy. So, um, what, ha what is happening, and, and I think the, the new piece of this that Cambridge Analytical lets us get our minds around, although with great difficulty, thugocracies are not just the bandits on the street going from business, small business, you know, going around Hamilton and shaking down the, you know, the small businesses, Hamilton Whole Foods, um, and getting them to pay their, their krisha, their protection. Right, that's the street level, that's the small scale. It started at small scale in Russia, but it really quickly ramped up to be totally transnational. So that the largest corporations, the, um, the oil companies, 
the aluminum companies, the nickel companies, the, the potash companies, the large, large, large state enterprises of every single kind are thugocratic. Their boards of directors, if you look at the boards of directors, they're all Putin cronies, and there are thousands of them, and Putin controls them very, very carefully. They, they use threat. They use threat of violence. They use assassination. They have many means of assassination, as we can see from the recent case in the UK, where Sergei Skripal and his daughter have been, um, have been uh, probably nearly assassinated. They're, they're, they're dying um, uh, by Novichok, a nerve agent that is obviously sourced from the Soviet from the from the Soviet stockpiles and the Russian stockpiles. Um, they use assassination, they use threat of assassination, they use performative assassination. That is like the, the Litvinenko killing, that is a performative assassination. That assassination was intended for the audience of the entire world. Don't mess with Russia. That's thugocracy. Um, the horrifying thing is that Trump is a thugocrat wannabe. If you watch Trump and you listen to Trump and you see how Trump is doing the same thing, putting his cronies, and these are criminals, some of them. Many of them are indicted criminals. Some of them are cr convicted criminals. Putting criminals of many different kinds, money launderers, first of all, in positions of great authority in his campaign, Paul Manafort, <coughs> and in his, uh, in his, I started to say, in his regime. Well, I'm going to say it, in his regime, in his in his, uh, in his circles of power around him in the White House and, and beyond the White House, installing thugocrats that, that can be controlled through threat, through blackmail, through bribery, um, through perf this sort of performative, thugocratic mode of, of, of communication. Um, and so what I don't really understand, you know, I, I spend hours on this every day, and I'll leave you with this thought. I don't really understand what Trump thinks about it. Does Trump have a theory of thugocracy, or it, does he just embody thugocracy? I, I, I don't know. What do you think, Jake Scott? <laughs> it, it, Trump doesn't come across as particularly intelligent himself, but he has a knack for this kind of behavior and, and getting success out of it. So I don't think he could explain it to you. I don't think he has vocabulary to it. But he does it every single day. He, he, has a, he has a real talent for it, a, a knack that's a, like a, an amazing skill at, at sort of thinking thugocratically, acting, performing, and, and creating, and, and networking with. This, these network ties are unbelievable when you start to go into them, networking with thugocrats. Um, and so what is utterly terrifying to me every single day, and the Cambridge Analytica, there are lots and lots of, you know, Cambridge Analytica is a very crucial connection point for the Russian hacking machine, which is a gigantic, very sophisticated um, 21st century <coughs> internet-based hacking machine, right? The most, the most sophisticated probably in the world. Um, and so watching the Cambridge Analytica story unfold, and they're not talking much about the Russian connections, but there are lots of Russian connections very well known, for, known for two years actually, in Cambridge Analytica. That may be Trump's undoing. The unfolding of this story about Cambridge Analytica may actually be the point at which it starts to, to fall apart. I don't know. <laughs> so what, um, my last, point is a question. What stops thugocracy? What stops thugocracy? Law. Law. Who said that? Law. Law. I never thought I'd become a law fetishist. Law stops, stops thugocracy. And what helps the law in stopping thugocracy? You all. You stop. You are the thugocrats' worst enemies, right? Because we support civil society. We are civil society. We support the law. We will take to the streets and the barricades when, if Mueller is, um, is fired. We are doing as many things as we can think of to do every single day. I know all of you in this room, or many of you are doing that every single day at great cost. Um, we are supporting, we're, the journalists are also the law and the fourth estate. That's who stops thugocracy. And notably, those are the people who get assassinated in <coughs> Russia. The, the, the non-corrupted lawyers and 
judges and activists, human rights activists, um, the, the, the non-corrupted journalists are the, and politicians are the ones who get assassinated in Putin's Russia. That tells you something. It makes you really sad and upset, but it also tells you that you are the thuggercrat's worst enemy. So go to it. Sorry if I went on too long. I'm uh, happy to take questions. You're on first, okay. man. One of the things that surprised me, having watched the Channel 4 uh, British piece, which is so fascinating, uh, was that in today's Times, uh, Washington Post, uh, Huffington Post, you, you, go, you go through it, almost no mention. I mean, it, it, was, it was a story yesterday. Today, it's sort of not there and, and I wondered I wondered why it seemed so much the story that should be the lead for forever but but uh, maybe they're doing some digging and they'll have a big scoop on maybe. Saturday or Sunday <laughs> so how do we keep those stories because those videos are amazing yes. and those thugocrats talking they reminded me of my my bandit friend right they're full of huff and puff. They're certainly exaggerating everything in all directions, but they're not exaggerating also. They're telling <coughs> some kind of really profound truth. Um, they, they didn't know they were being taped. <laughs> um, though, if you haven't watched those videos, drill in and try to find them. They're not entirely easy to find, but you can find them. They're, they're really amazing. Um, as kind of examples of how thuggocrats think. And, and remember, thuggocrats are not just sort of card-carrying gangsters. This is what's hard for, I think, for most Americans to get their minds around. So Russians have no problem. They know that every other person is a thuggocrat in some dimension. Maybe not every other, but um, many, many people are, are behaving thuggocratically. They're, they're capturing state resources. They're doing illegal election electioneering and election hacking, et cetera. Just to be clear, yeah. I want because I wasn't sure I was hearing everything. You're talking about the videos of the people from Cambridge Analytica, yeah. yeah, on channel BBC, it's not BBC, yeah. but UK yeah. channel four. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think in regard to your question that you asked, your almost final question about Trump, I think you actually answered that in the beginning of your speech. He absorbed that behavior as he was growing up. Mm -hmm. These were the people who were surrounding him the way he learned about life. And then when he got out on his own, in his own New York City world of real estate, he dealt with those people. Now he's just at a higher level. And what I fail to understand, I mean, New York, okay, it's a small town. How is he getting away with this? Honestly, how are our governmental officials saying this is all okay? Jake is working on this. He's got his answer for this question. Well, the answer for why he never gets, seems to be, why he's able to escape investigations is one of the stories we're trying to piece together. Because if you look at, in New Jersey, in New York, he always, it's not for lack of trying. He's been investigated for this, that, and the other thing. And yet, always he seems to get away with it. And, and really part of it, it's kind of an unsatisfying answer, answer is, part of thugocracy is you know the people who are doing the investigating, or you know people who know people. Um, what I think is really important, the point you made, is these are the people he grew up with. His father, Fred Trump, thuggocrat through and through. He used the organized crime, he used public corruption, and um, the self-professed mentor of Trump, when he, was, when he was becoming who he was, was a guy by the name of Roy Cohn. And if you don't know who Roy Cohn is, I have this right now. Look into that. That's the kind of person he idolized. He literally, he said, in like an adoring fashion, this is, he was like, Roy Cohn's been under indictment for two thirds of his life. And, and Trump was saying that as a good thing. That's the kind of person who Trump learned from. So that's why he acts this way. Future senator. Yeah. <laughs> What is it? What was in it for Misha? So I was in my mm, upper thirties, and uh, you know, a kind of uh, attractiveness, uh, you know, curiosity. A, 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 a youngish woman speaking Russian, um, 
knowing, so I, I speak Russian fluently, but I also know Russian discourse. So I could ask him, you know, I could ask him exactly the right questions. I, I, I was enough fluent in Russian culture by that time. Um, and, uh, and I've been studying Russian since 72. So that I could, uh, in Russian they say, get, you know, get inside something, get, really get through, through and through kind of knowing what the, what's going on. And, and for people in Moscow, already by that time, that wasn't particularly interesting, but for, for people in a provincial city, that's like a curiosity. And I think he was proud of it. I think he was proud to drag me around to all these places, and here's this person, who is she? You know, she speaks Russian. Um, there was a kind of charm in it, and it, it raised his social capital. I, I said, I, I usually say I'm a sociologist in those settings because they don't know what anthropologist means. They think you're an archeologist. So I say, you know, I'm a sociologist, yes, sociologue. And um, they were interested in being studied. They found it kind of cute that they just, a young American woman was studying them. And until I ended up at the safe house and the gangsters, big gangsters, um, suddenly figured out I wasn't, mm. I wasn't just some Natasha. Mm -hmm. um, we were cooking for them, my, my female friend and I. Um, and he said, so, Aktoreta, who's this? And I said, Nancy. Um, and he said, Nancy, what kind of a person? There were, there were about 12 gangsters there. He said, what kind of a person is Nancy? And I said, I'm, well, I'm from the US. I'm a sociologist. And, and he stood right in front of me in, in this thugocratic way. He had a zoot suit on, literally. And he said, how do we know you are who you say you are? A sociologist? So you probably work for the CIA. See that river out there? And there was a river. The Volga River was right outside the window. He said, see that river out there? And you say you're from Chicago? Um, Remember what happens in Chicago? We're just going to put concrete on your feet and put you in the river. Um, and I, I'm thinking, he's, he's, this is all bluff. It's that thing that Jake said. You know, it's this kind of thugocratic behavior, and it's playing with women. I think the fact that I was a woman, I'm, in Russia, women are not dangerous for the most part. Um, so they're not threatening. They're, you know, women can't do you any harm. So um, I think it was just a curiosity thing. I, I wondered about that at the time. I've written about that question, like, why did they let me hang out with them? Um, but I think they were just, they just found it funny, really. And, you know, and they could, you know, he could show off that he had an American sociologist with him. Um, they didn't think I would write about them. <laughs> so, yes, one, one more question. I was just wondering if you could reflect on the, um, the factor of, of misguided evangelism in the U.S. and how that is supporting the Trump th thugocracy, even though it is, it, on the surface, it seems contradictory to its values. Was there any parallel in Russia? Uh, well, American evangelicals went, have been going to Russia and um, actually stimulating a Russian, uh, a, a Russian evangelical movement that is actually American in its nature. Um, so that it's uh, you know it's, it's very conservative, anti-abortion, um, and and pro NRA. Um, so there's all these really weird connections. I I, I think that's a a great question and it allows me to say something else. But the Odyssey works in every sector of society. So if you think back to James ba Baker, Baker, whatever his name was, if you think about the top wrong evangelical preachers who have the mega mega churches Absolutely. in the United States. If you think about them, and some of them have gone to Russia and made a ton of money in Russia and in Ukraine and Moldova, um, those are those people are are thugs. Okay? They are also they're doing exactly what the gangsters do with the state. They are utilizing their churches as their ministries as um, you know I think about this as a as a hose. For a giant hose for sucking up money. And you can suck up the money a couple kopecks or a couple pennies at a time from the poor churchgoers, or you can suck it up by the billions by exploiting you know, large mega corporations and natural resource um, sources. So um, the thugocrats know uh, how to use every sector. Those people are thugs. They're also thugs in the entertainment industry. So think about, you know, Miss Universe. Anytime you see a pageant or an Olympics or FIFA, well, there's no, there's, there's no accident.
president that the soccer, you know, FIFA is going to be in Russia this coming summer, right? Those are thugocratic organizations through and through. They are the, they are the best vehicles for money laundering, quick, money, quick and pretty easy to hide money laundering that there are. Beauty pageants, beauty pageants are also sites for the generation of <coughs> prostitution and sex trafficking. Um, these, these are thugocratic sectors, and, and so there are many different sectors other than just the law, you know, governance and politics and business and mafia and, and the spy agencies that can be thugocratic. Um, and so I hadn't thought about putting the, the mega churches and the evangelicals there. Um, they're also really political organizations, not just churches. So thank you so much for inviting me.